So thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit here um, to uh, some of the work that we do um, in schools. Um, but let me, before I get to the specifics of the work that we do, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my, my lab that I run. Um, so I run the teacher education program here, which is uh, kind of also part of something we call the Education Arcade. Um, and uh, together, these programs mostly focus on um, creating educational games and simulations. And that spans everything from um, games we've done in history in the past. This is a game on math in the lower left-hand corner. This is an environment we have for kids creating their own games and simulations. And the upper left um, is a screen, uh, is a, is a uh, photograph of someone playing one of our augmented reality games. Um, I'm gonna, when I talk about augmented reality, some of you may have a vision of what that means. Um, to me, I'm going to use a very broad definition of what that is. And that is uh, any kind of computer simulation that's kind of a hybrid between a real world experience and a virtual world experience. Um, so anything that combines some of the two of those contexts. Um, from our perspective, these are scenarios in which we can uh, engage people in fictional but realistic and authentic situations. Um, and that because they're in the real world and you have all the facility of interacting with people face to face through communication, that they can be social as well. Um, so to differentiate from if you have some, some preconception about what uh, augmented reality is, to differentiate what I might call um, heavy augmentation, which is um, let's see, here we go, heavy augmentation, which is what you might see where you have a helmet or uh, some sort of uh, goggles or something like that, and superimposes a lot of virtual information onto the real world. Um, that's a, a kind of a classic example of that is this game, uh, Virtual Pac-Man here, where you actually have to, you're, you're wearing some sort of backpack with, with uh, a, uh, uh, goggles or some sort of lenses that superimpose where every dot in the world is as you move around, and you get very fast feedback on where that virtual information is and what it is. Um, that compares with what we call light augmentation, where you just have a little bit of virtual information that's um, embedded into the, into the real world. So that it provides, the real world provides most of the context, but the virtual world can provide kind of some supplemental information. In our cases, we do that simply through um, cell phones, PDAs. So to compare what, what our vision of heavy and light, um, you can imagine that, imagine that MIT is contaminated with a toxin. So in order to do that, MIT still represents itself, its location, its the time that we're in, um, our proximity to, to real people, real medical facilities, real water supplies. Um, so if we thought that there was some chemical spill on the MIT campus, we would just need to provide the, the users in that simulation with some information on where that toxin is and what it's doing. Compare that with, imagine that MIT is an underwater aquarium and you're some sort of fish swimming in this uh, aquarium, you'd really need a lot more virtual information. You need to know, like, when am I bumping into things? You know, I need to know something about the spatial scale that I'm on because it's a bit different. I need to have some sense of um, how fast I can move relative to the world, and is there some temporal as well as spatial difference? So we focus, we focus on, the, on, the, on, the, on the light end. Um, our first game that we created was a game called Environmental Detectives. Um, it was a game built here for the MIT campus, um, uh, and then, then ported to a bunch of uh, high schools, uh, to some nature centers. And the idea in this game was that players were briefed that there was some outbreak of health issues in the community. And uh, you needed to figure out what was going on. Um, was this linked? Was the, oh, there was also some sort of um, construction process going on at the MIT campus. And during that construction process, they found some chemicals in the groundwater. And you need to determine whether the chemicals in the groundwater are associated with the break, outbreak of illness in the community. Uh, you have a, a, a budget, which is really kind of uh, how many samples you're allowed to take in, in the world and how much information you're allowed to collect. Because when students often enter these situations, because it's partially virtual, their expectation is, well, I can just get all the information. I will know where everything is. I will know what happened. But we're trying to really simulate an authentic situation here where that's not possible. We don't have the resources to be able to sample everywhere and get all the information. So instead, they need to think like people who might really be investigating a scenario like this and how this would happen. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, they have uh, a screen that looks like this. And uh, their location is given to them by this little orange dot. And as they move around, that moves around with them. Um, the things that they have here, I'll talk a little bit about these. But there's these pink things. These are, um, in this case, these are virtual characters that they can interview. Some of those may give, uh, be witnesses. They may tell you something they saw. 
Other ones may be experts on particular topics, and they might give you documents. And you can click on them and know who they are, so you can plan where you're going. Um, these blue things here, and this is a body of water. So this blue thing here is uh, our water sampling stations. Now, what we did behind the scenes is make a model of, OK, if, if this scenario happened, what would actually happen in, to, the, to the groundwater and the surface water in this area? We run that model, and then we kind of put that data in this, in this virtual world here. So um, in this case, maybe the, the spill was over here or something like that. And so then we can model what the sampling of different chemicals would be at those different locations. So it's not. Um, it's kind of combining something that's much like um, the kind of monitoring that one a, a kid a kid might be able to do in their community. Only in this case, they're actually investigating something that um, that was potentially catastrophic. Uh, let's see. Uh, everybody can view virtual characters. You can get audio and video, text, documents. They can be very rich in terms of what the characters can supply you with. Oh, oh and it's important. It's it is it's more than just kind of a virtual web browser. Um, the game is dynamic, so things can change over time. So you can speak to one character, and if someone else, another character, uh, knows that you spoke to that character, they may not want to speak to you. Or a new character might tell you about uh, a friend of theirs that you should go speak to. So the game changes over time um, in reaction to what you're doing inside the game to make it a, a virtual, a real uh, authentic experience. Uh, it's really important that players are in roles. Um, we often have anywhere between three and five roles in a game. So there are, there's redundancy, because a game might be played by 20 or more students. Uh, and each role has a specific sort of cap set of capabilities um, in the game. And this, we do this to design uh, what we call jigsawing, so that students have overlapping information about the problem at hand, so that they have some common context for, for talking to each other. But not so much that everybody's redundant so that they don't need to talk to each other. Um, so for example, the environmental scientists can take uh, soil samples. So they can go around and they, can, they have virtual sampling equipment. It gives them, uh, at any point in space, it gives them the readings of different chemicals in the, in the soil at that, at that location. Um, so the way they use that is they, I think maybe there's something on the screen here. The way they use that is they just simply walk to a location. They have a certain number of samples uh, that they're allowed to take. Um, there's a processing time, and it comes back to them, and they get quantitative data that they can then analyze. So here, um, here's, whoa, whoops, I didn't want to do that. OK. Um, here, uh, here there's a, a soil sample. It's, they have a chance uh, to analyze it in two different ways. They can use a fast sample, which gives them an inaccurate but faster response, and they can use a, get a, a more accurate but uh, response that's in the lab that takes time. And they have all that information. And it's a matter of them kind of weighing what the different sampling choices are and how they might actually use that information. Um, we actually did, people ask us, well, why, why do you actually do this on mobile devices outside? It seems like you could do this inside of a lab and kids wouldn't need to go outside and get their feet wet. Um, and uh, so we actually did some comparisons where we built the same game in a, in a virtual world that they played inside the, uh, in the real world. And uh, just this is somewhat anecdotal. We haven't, we've done uh, just a, a few classes uh, in terms of trials through these two different methods. And uh, there's certainly communication that varies. As I said, they're in the real world, so they communicate face to face. And when you have that capability, your conversations tend to be different. Um, they use the environment, so they can, they'll talk about geography in, in a little bit different way. Um, at MIT, they'll talk about proximity to the river. They'll talk about proximity to uh, traffic and things like that. So they think about the landscape. Another place, there was a, it was a nature center where there's actually two kind of watersheds that come together. And they were able to really see how, that, how, that, how the hills kind of sloped and what that would mean for, for water flow, which is harder to assess when you're in, in a virtual world. But the most important thing is actually that um, when we gave uh, it turns out uh, in MIT in the scenario, the chemical, that, when we put it, is right in the middle of Killian Court. Killian Court is the one grassy area that we have on the MIT campus. It's, um, it's really, there's, there's, it's, it, that's it. And it's, it's, very, it's, it's kind of the, the archetype of what MIT is. It's the dome. It's what everybody kind of recognizes. And uh, the players in the, in the, in the uh, virtual world said, well, that's where the chemical is. We should just drill down. We should suck it out. And we should clean it up. Um, and that's the correct engineering decision to do, and that's what we should do. The people who were playing the augmented reality game said, well, it's, we know that this is the problem here, but it turns out that this chemical 
is really only a problem um, in, uh, in drinking water, and we don't drink the groundwater in Cambridge, so that's not, a, that's not really a big health issue. Um, yes, it can leach into the river, but it's extremely volatile, and so it's, it's going to just evaporate kind of as soon as it hits the river and probably won't have any adverse effects there either. And we know that MIT has kind of a tenuous relationship with the community. We see all these people walking down the street. We see people driving right in front of this. We see people rowing in the river. If we put a big drill rig right here in the middle of Killian Court, it's going to look really bad for MIT. It's going to be a bad, it's going to be a bad decision. So instead, what we should do is we know that trees, planting trees, has some nominal effect on this chemical. And eventually, in about 100 years, it'll, it'll all be gone. Um, and we'll put the trees there. We'll feel like we did the right thing. It'll be a much better relationship with the community. And ethically, we'll feel, we'll feel responsible about that. Legally, we're in a gray area, but we might be OK. And uh, in terms of health issues, we know that we're OK with that. So their, in, their information and their decision-making process was much more nuanced and much more uh, taking into account the social aspects as well as the scientific ones. Um, so we kind of made a, a bunch of these games and eventually realized, well, taking a game from place to place uh, involves at least kind of moving a map and GPS coordinates, making sure you don't need to like get, talk to somebody in the middle of a road or something like that. Um, but really to capitalize on this idea that the, the, the people are taking into account the social as well as the scientific aspects of the games, we need to be able to uh, really write new scenarios or adapt scenarios so that it takes into account some of the local factors when we're actually writing these games. So we need to make it easy for designers to create these games and not just technical folks. Um, so we created a, an editor that allows people to kind of pull in a Google map. And you can drop down different little icons here. You can create rules about how things interact. You can uh, uh, put scientific data. You can uh, put spatial data as well as just kind of point-based data into the world that people can play to define your roles, define how things change over time, uh, and create a game that way. Um, but we realized that one thing that we were really interested in doing was not just having designers create these games. We really wanted kids to be able to create these games. We wanted kids to be able to kind of understand issues in their communities and be able to create games that either uh, help them understand them themselves or help the community understand those issues. And that kind of tool, when we think about different characters, different roles, different times, different places, it's, it's a huge multi-dimensional space. And it's really hard for kids to be able to think that way. So we created a, a new tool um, that would reduce the complexity, time, and cognitive load. And that kind of fed into two projects. One is called the LIONS, which is Local Investigations of Natural Science, and uh, CSI, which is, stands for Community Science Investigators. Um, so LIONS uh, was a program in, uh, in Missouri, um, just uh, in St. Louis and kind of in nearby areas. Uh, Low-income uh, schools. Um, it was a combination of uh, an after school and a summer program. Um, uh, at nine different sites in the area. Um, this is what the tool looks like. Um, it's kind of uh, much simpler. You have a map, and the map is templated. And, the, and in this case, the students could add um, characters and um, items to the world. Items could be, could be point scientific data. Uh, and this is just an example of what one of the kids made. Um, this is the most interesting of the examples that the kids made. Uh, it's a game called The Key to the City. In this case here, the, 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 somehow the, the students had this idea that the key to the city, which is we always see kind of the mayor giving out to somebody, was actually a really important thing. And the key to the city had been lost. So they kind of gave some rhymes here to, to talk about what happened. And so it turned out you had to understand that um, you had to go to the tree to find the first clue. And what they had done is um, taken a like, a, you know, like you have ransom notes where you're, they're kind of in letters from the newspaper. They had done that, and they kind of ripped it up and put pieces of that um, in different places so you had to find them. The interesting thing here also was that um, it is GPS guided, so you get to the tree, but you get to the area of the tree. But GPS is not so accurate in the devices we use and cell phones that it kind of gets you within about you know, 20, 30 meters of the tree. And so you actually have to think about where it might be based on the clue. And so this, uh, this person just kind of took them through then um, a, series of, a series of clues that went from one thing to the next. Um, let's kind of skip through this. And eventually, you find the, the key at the end. Um, one of the problems we had with this was that st students kind of told interesting interactive, semi-interactive narratives. But they were pretty linear. 
Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of the work that we do is in the game space. And one of the reasons why we think games are interesting and useful educational tools is because they're kind of complex and multidimensional and you can kind of explore them in different ways. And we thought keeping kids on the rails, as we did in the, in the first iteration, didn't allow them to think in that same multidimensional way. We don't want it to be so multidimensional that it's, that it's imposing like it is in the full tool, but we want them to be a little bit, uh, bit nonlinear. So we created a second version. In this case, um, we have uh, some slightly more interesting things that can happen. You can have uh, basically cause and effect. So you do something in the game, and it affects something else in the game. We also added more dynamic media that they could put in there. Um, and so that's been the basis for this new project called Community Science Investigators. Um, Community Science Investigators uh, is a project that's based both here and in Missouri. Um, we have parallel sites. Um, and the structure is we have, um, in each place there's, well, we're starting with three sites this year in each place, moving to six sites next year. And they're in school, so there's two teachers at each site. Um, and those teachers then run after school clubs for their students. Um, but it's, it's, so it's kind of school based, but after school. Uh, you can see here, we're trying to kind of uh, engage students who are interested in issues in their community and understanding them and ultimately affecting change in their communities. Uh, it has three components. Um, so there's augmented reality games, which I mentioned. There's GIS and there's service learning. So the idea here is to use GIS to kind of understand issues in your community. Maybe it's things about water quality. Maybe it's things about um, population. Maybe it's things about crime. Uh, and then use that GIS information to help you kind of understand that issue. Make an augmented reality game that helps educate the community about that. And then really try to affect change about that issue by doing service learning in the community. So it's kind of, it's, it's linking all those different things. And that explains why we have this particular partnership. So our expertise is in augmented reality games. Uh, the Missouri Botanical Gardens has done a lot of work with kids using GIS to understand issues in their community. And we're also, and they've also done work on service learning. Um, so I, just to service learning. Um, Sometimes people think of this as just kind of like, well, I, it's, it's, a, it's volunteering or something like that, doing something in your community. But service learning, in this case here, we're really trying to actually not only have them serve the community and do things, but we're having, trying, trying to have them learn and serve particular curricular purposes at the same time. So our goal here, this is NSF funded, so our goal here is to teach them partially about technology and partially about the scientific issues um, underlying the problems that they're studying. Um, and uh, so they're after school clubs. We had a, a two week um, a two week workshop to train teachers this summer. And the first workshops for kids now starting uh, weekly will uh, are starting right about now. So I don't have a lot of data on this yet. Um, we have, as I mentioned, sites both here and in, in Missouri. Um, this is the kind of GIS. So the idea is you have GIS, you kind of put it into the augmented reality games. These are some of the teachers that we had working on the project this summer. The teachers are seeding the workshops with um, some issues that they've already started studying um, themselves. And that's it. <laughs>